I want to look at the idea of linear independence and to illustrate what linear independence is, let's consider we uh, set S of vectors. So let's call it vector V1, V2, out to Vn. And this set is said to be linearly independent. Uh, if I can only get zero from these vectors in, in one way. So what I mean by that is if I can take scalars and multiply across these vectors and add them up, where I have C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus C3, V3, so on, all the way up to C and V N, and I want to get zero, or the zero vector here, if the only way I can do that is if C1 and C2 and all of those, those scalars are all zero, if, the only, if that's the only way I can do this, then this set is called linearly independent. If there's a way where I can have not all of my C's are, zero, are uh, not zero. So if some uh, C, let's call it CJ, is not zero, but when I multiply all this out, the C1, V1, the C2, V2, and wherever the CJ, VJ is in there, and so on, all the way up to C, N, V, N, and I get zero, then it's called linearly dependent. And uh, this can serve a variety of contexts. Um, you deal with this the most in linear algebra, talking about vector spaces, but it also comes up in differential equations where we're trying to find general solutions uh, to higher order differential equations. And so I'm going to uh, focus on that application in this video. So for example, let's suppose that we have, this time we have a set of functions f1, f2, I like to fn. And this function, you can think of them as serving the same role as a vector. This set is linearly independent. If the only way I can get 0 the only way I can get 0 from a, what we call a linear combination of these functions is if C1 and C2, etc., all are zero. If that's the case, then this set has linear independence, or it's linearly independent. So how do you know this set of functions is linearly independent? Sometimes you can just see it by looking. Sometimes it's pretty tricky to know for sure. So we need to have some sort of catch-all formula for this, and we do. It's in the method known as Ronskians, or determining the Ronskian. And what a Ronskian is, is really just a determinant. So if I take a Ronskian of a group of functions, it's the determinant of those functions and their derivatives, so f1 prime, f1 double prime, all the way down to the nth derivative of f1, and f2 prime and f2 double prime and f2 nth derivative, and then same with fn, going on to the nth derivative of fn. I take the determinant of that matrix. Okay, so um, that's what the Ronskian is. Now my set, S, is linearly independent if and only if Uh, the Ronskian is not zero. And let's see. That should be a T there, not a D. Sorry. So we know that uh, my set is linearly independent if and only if my Ronskian is not zero. So that kind of takes out all the clutter. Now I'll, sh I'll show a couple examples where we can um, determine whether these are linearly independent or not. So for my first example, I'm going to take a look at e to the 2x and e to the negative x. So now again, remember, you're trying to think, the question is, can I find a c1 and a c2 where they get 0, but either c1 
is not zero or C2 is not zero. Is that possible? Now when we only have two functions, it's kind of easy to see that that's not going to be possible. You're going to have to have C1 and C2 to be zero in order for this thing to add up to give me zero. And when I say zero, I mean regardless of x, okay? So we're not considering values of x here. All right, so what I'm going to do though is I'm going to take the Ronskian of these two guys and show that this Ronskian is not zero. So again, the Ronskian would be you take your functions and you compute their derivatives to get a, a square matrix. So here, the derivative e to the 2x is 2 e to the 2x. And the derivative e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x. And when I take its derivative, I get e to the 2x times, not the derivative, the determinant. So if you have, if you have forgotten, the determinant of a 2 by 2 is you multiply those two together, and you multiply these two together, and then you subtract. So that's going to be e to the 2x times negative e to the negative x minus 2e to the 2x times e to the negative x. All right, so that gives me, uh, let's see, negative e to the x minus 2e to the x. So I get negative 3e to the x, which is not 0. So this set is linearly independent. Okay, now in the context of differential equations, that would that's a good thing. That means that we don't have redundancy in our set. And again, how do you test for that? Through the Ronskian. Now I'm going to look at another example that's a little more involved, but not too bad. And this time my set's going to be s equals e to the 2x cosine x and 2 e to the 2x. Okay, and I'm wondering, is this set linearly dependent or independent? And so I'm going to jump straight to the Ronskian. So I want to figure out the Ronskian of these guys. And so I, I'm going to build a square determinant, or a square matrix to take the determinant. And I fill it out to be square using derivatives. So I need... Uh, the derivative e to the 2x, which is 2 e to the 2x. And then its second derivative would be 4 e to the 2x. The derivative of cosine is, don't forget your negative, negative sine x. And the derivative of that would be negative cosine x. And then uh, I have 4 e to the 2x and then 8 e to the 2x. And I got to take this 3 by 3 determinant. Now to do 3 by 3 determinants, I'm going to pick a row or a column. So here there's not really a great choice, we'll just pick this one. And I've got a march down, and I'm going to end up with three 2x2 two two determinants like this. So it's going to be uh, e to the 2x times the, the determinant I would get by deleting this row and column. So there's my first determinant, that's negative sine x, negative cosine x, 4e to the 2x, 8e to the 2x. All right, the next one would be t 2e to the 2x. And if I delete that middle row in that first column, I end up with cosine x, 2e to the 2x, negative cosine x, and 8e to the 2x. And then lastly, I have 4e to the 2x times the derivative of deleting the third row in the first column or the determinant, I'm sorry, the matrix. You have cosine 2e to the 2x, negative cosine, and 8e to the 2x. Okay, so I end up having to take three 2x2 two two determinants. Oh, and I need to lace these up, so I have plus, minus, plus, and it'll always alternate. And so, in general, you want to think of like a, check, a checkerboard across your matrix here of pluses and minuses. So depending on which row or column you go across, you need to follow the appropriate signs, which I did here, plus, minus, plus. Okay, now continuing with the work, here we have e to the 2x times, uh, so I'm multiplying across here and across there and subtracting. So it's going to be negative 8 e to the 2x sine x minus a negative so it's plus, 
4e to the 2x cosine x. That's my first guy. Then I have minus e to the 2x, 8e to the 2x cosine x, minus a negative, so that's a plus, 2e to the 2x cosine x. Okay, this is getting hairy, right? Plus, let's see if I have enough room, 4e to the 2x times 8e to the 2x cosine x minus a negative, so that's plus 2e to the 2x uh, sine x, right? I made a mistake here. Right, we deleted that bottom column, so actually I made a mistake here. That should be uh, negative sine x and 4e to the 2x. I'm sorry for the confusion there, so let's correct that here. This should be a 4e to the 2x cosine x minus a negative 2e to the 2x sine x. Okay, great. Now there's a lot going on here, but notice that everything has an e to the 2x in it, and there's an e to the 2x times each one of these um, expansions. So I can factor out an e to the 2x times e to the 2x, which is actually e to the 4x. And when I do that, I have negative 8 sine x plus 4 cosine x. Okay, uh, a minus 2 being distributed across, so that's uh, a minus, well notice that's 10 cosine x, right? So that's minus 20 cosine x, plus, now distributing the 4 across here, I have a 16 cosine x plus an 8 sine x, and notice, this is kind of weird, but I have, um, 4 cosine x and 16 cosine x and negative 20 cosine x, those cancel out. And a negative 8 and a positive 8 sine x, so those cancel out. So I end up with e to the 4x times 0, which gives me 0. Now actually with this example, if we had thought about it at the beginning, we could have seen that this is linearly dependent. Because again, if you had the set s equals e to the 2x cosine x, and 2e to the 2x, I could have said uh, negative 2e to the 2x plus 0 cosine x plus 2e to the 2x and gotten 0, and not all of my coefficients here are 0. One of them is, but not all of them. So we could have done that pretty easily at the beginning, but I wanted to use this to show the Ron scan will always determine this because it's not always easy to spot ahead of time that these are linearly dependent. This is a great tool to use in linear algebra and in differential equations. I hope it answers some questions. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. And thanks again.